Okay, we are on the air. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming this evening. We have a really important uh, interview that I that uh, we're about to launch into. Um, I'm sure you're all here because you all know about Silk Road, you all know about um, Ross Ulbricht, um, and by association you know about Lynn Ulbricht, Ross's mother. Uh, so I'll be inter uh, interviewing Lynn tonight about the trial, uh, about the verdict, and also about the um, recently revealed police corruption associated with the, uh, the Silk Road investigation. So this is, this is a trial that it's important for so many reasons. This goes so far beyond uh, just talking about Ross um, and this specific case. This trial actually, actually sets up so many precedents um, that may become very important later on down the line. So it, it's, it's tremendously important. And uh, I'm really, really happy to have Lynn here to talk to you all because um, she, you know, she has first-hand experience of, of, of what happened in the trial. And um, I, yeah, I, I would just love you all to engage her with questions. Uh, before we launch into that, I just wanted to go over a little bit about how Spreecast works for those of you who don't know. So if you look at the bottom underneath the video screen, you will see viewer questions and suggestions. So for anyone who's actually logged on and who isn't just a visitor on the site, you can submit questions at any time. And I will go through them and field those to, to Lynn as we go. So feel free to participate. You know, this is your chance to really engage Lynn to find out more about what happened to get your questions answered. So I really do encourage you to, to log in and, and participate in that way. I also wanted to draw your attention to the chat bar on the side. You should see a, a bar that says viewers and it has chats there and you have a few people who've been uh, chatting already. Travis, William, Eitan, Yuri. Um, hi, all of you. Anyone else who wants to participate in the chat, please feel free. I'll be chatting in there uh, myself as well. Um, I really encourage this to be um, a, a very interactive session. You know, this, is, as I said, is a tremendously important topic. Um, any insights that, that we can gain from this, um, any actionable items we can get at the end of this. All of this is great because, as I said, this trial just sets so many precedents for the future. It's just really worth paying attention to. So with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to, to Lynn. Um, thank you so much, Lynn. Welcome to this Spreecast chat for um, Liberty.me. Um, go ahead and, and tell us who you are and just a little bit about Silk Road and uh, Ross's involvement in all of this. Well, I'm Ross's mother and I've been catapulted into this other life that I'm living now um, by his arrest. And um, I, you know, I um, have seen up close and personal how a citizen is prosecuted in this country, and I'm very alarmed about it. Um, I don't believe Ross got a fair trial, which is also, I believe, very dangerous to everyone. And because I feel like we don't have a free, free trials in this country, we're all in big trouble. And um, so I'm working very hard. Um, I worked very hard for his defense at trial, incurred a huge debt, but. Now we are moving towards, well, he will be sentenced May 15th. Um, and because of mandatory minimums, we're just hoping for 20 years. That's how draconian this is. And this is for nonviolent offenses. Um, and actually, we've been told by a couple of lawyers that the prosecution pushes for the maximum, and that is the equivalent of life. So it's, this is what is in our future in the next few weeks. And then we will appeal. And we're going to appeal, Ross will, not only for himself, but there's very dangerous precedents that have been set with this uh, trial. And um, it's important that they, we push back against them. And um, yeah. I guess we're going to talk so about this a little a, bit. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's take a step back. Um, so. Ross was convicted uh, of being the mastermind behind the site Silk Road. Now, as I said before, I'm presuming everyone here knows what the Silk Road is, and that's what made you interested in coming on here. Um, but basically, for if by chance anyone doesn't, Silk Road was basically a free marketplace on the internet. Um, it was mainly used for buying and selling um, uh, illicit drugs. And uh, Ross was charged as, as being the, the person who was in charge of all of this, who went under the pseudonym of Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, and uh, they believe that that Ross was was tied to this identity. But I mean, Lynn, tell me a little bit about the trial because it seems that 
Um, th there's a whole lot of, of waffling and flip-flopping going on with this. You know, different government agencies who actually uh, swore affidavits that there were there were other people that they believed were, were um, the real identity behind Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, and there was there was a two week window where one of the lead in investigators uh, went from believing it was this person to this other person, and then Ross was arrested. I mean, this all seems it, it's just a very fast pace after believing it to be one person for two years and then then suddenly changing. So talk me through the, the what actually happened in the trial a little bit and what your experience was there. Okay, um, I want to just go back to the first thing you said, which is I I believe that well what Ross has admitted to is designing a, a free market, open market place online that had very few restrictions. It did have restrictions such as child pornography, things that harmed, but um, drugs was not restrict drugs were not restricted, but it wasn't designed specifically, from what I understand, as a drug website. Um, now the anonymity of the site would attract that. But um, anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, yeah, no, there was a great um, article in Forbes uh, that whoever was behind the Dread Pirate Roberts at that stage, um, they basically said that that um, Silk Road was for anything that the government has made illegal that we don't believe should be made illegal or we don't believe the government has the right to interfere or inject themselves in people's uh, lives in that way. Um, then we will allow people to freely trade these things on this site um, and we will discount anything that uh, is harmful. So mm -hmm. if, if there's anything that where, where harm was, was, um, was caused in order to, to get the substance or harm is, is caused after the fact, they actually wouldn't allow it on the site. Right, and there's been many misconceptions. I mean, Newsweek magazine had on the cover that it was uh, the Amazon for hitmen. You couldn't get hitmen on the Silk Road. I even uh, read, oh, my sister was talking to someone who said, oh yeah, you could buy people on the Silk Road. I'm like, no. <laughs> and I had actually seen that written in, in, on, in some article. I mean, it's become so distorted. Um, so anyway, I wanted to clarify that. Um, as regards the trial, um, the first witness was DHS agent Jared Dreyagin, who um, had been on the site for two years undercover thousands of hours um, as the identity Cirrus. And he, um, through his investigations, had various suspects, but he, and he also said that he believed many people use the DPR handle, but he was honing in on uh, Mark Carpellis as his prime suspect and to the point where he um, sw uh, signed sworn affidavits and uh, that he had probable cause to suspect him and sought a warrant for his Gmail account. And this was all coming out in cross-examination uh, by the defense and it the, the prosecution objected to the point where the whole thing was ground to a halt, the jury was sent home early, and um, the and they argued with the court about how this was not relevant. And um, initially, the the judge said, "Yeah, it is relevant." And in fact, goes to the heartland of the defense, an alternate perpetrator. And um, the cat's out of the bag. This guy, you know, they, he was pursuing him. She literally said, "The cat's out of the bag." And um, we all went. Court was adjourned over a four-day ho weekend holiday. And by the time we got back the ne on the fourth day of trial, it was a completely different court. It had done a complete 180. All of um, that testimony was deemed irrelevant. It was stricken from the record. The jury was told to forget about it, like, you know, you didn't hear that. The court actually flagged um, things that the prosecution should have objected to but didn't so that they sh it could be sustained retroactively, like they got a mulligan. And um, there were very strict restrictions put on how questioning could go forward. The defense attorney had another hour that he wanted to delve into this whole issue. And basically, um, he was hamstrung. And um, so we never got to proceed, and, and the whole trajectory of the trial from then on was changed and defense witnesses were blocked 
um, and evidence was suppressed. And it, it's not just these corrupt agents. Of course, that information was completely suppressed. Yeah. But Duryagan's um, investigation, and even um, another example is Inigo was a top-ranking administrator on the site. His, his um, Andrew Michael Jones is his name. He's in custody. And he was going to be a witness, and they took him off the witness. Uh, they, they yanked him from the list. But he had made a statement that the defense wanted to present to the jury. And it, it was this, that in August of 13, Inigo wanted to talk to, to DPR. But because no one knows who's behind these handles, and because it was somewhat well known that there are more than one DPR, he and this, the two, these two people had decided on a digital handshake, an identity thing. But when Inigo presented the prompt, this DPR didn't know the answer. And the defense wanted to present that to the jury, and the prosecution blocked it. Even that little tiny bit of information that implied that maybe there was more than one DPR could not be heard by the jury. And there were many yeah. things. Ross's libertarian philosophy of peace and voluntarism and um, nonviolence was not allowed to be mentioned to the jury. I mean, it was blocked. Yeah. You know, there's so many, yes, they had a particular narrative, and that was all, and the, and the jury was basically spoon fed that narrative, and that was all that they were going to hear if the prosecution, well, they did. They, they stopped them from hearing anything else. I mean, that's so all a lot very important suppressed. information that was um, that was kept out of it. It seems like the defense's hands were really tight uh, during yeah. this process, and and Russ did, really did not get, in any sense of the word, a, a fair trial. Um, and I also read a lot about the jury selection, how younger people, anyone who had a science degree, basically, um, they were stricken from from being on the on the jury. They were removed from the pickings. Um, so basically yeah, what we were left with were um, mainly people over 40 um, and very few people under who 40 really... Under the jury, that's all. Wow. Yeah, and the people who were on the jury um, really had such a, a severe lack of understanding um, about any of the workings of the internet. I mean, you had um, testimonials, you had people providing evidence that basically was explaining to people on the jury how chat forums worked, how chat forums were different to direct messaging. I mean, you think of the complexity of Bitcoin, you think of the complexity of the Tor network, um, and it, even the idea that they had any conception of what any of this meant, I mean, it's just laughable. Um, so it, it really does seem like the, the jury was um, was was cherry picked, you know, uh, from from my understanding to be disadvantageous to the defense. Um, I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. I don't know. Um, I do know it was a very quick selection, um, a lot of pressure to choose quickly. Uh, it was done by noon oh, yeah. the first day. Most jury selections take at least a day, sometimes two. The uh, defense did yeah. not have a chance to consult with each other about who. I mean, that did happen because I saw that myself. Um, right. And in terms of like the, how fast jury. everything went. Um, yeah. it, in terms of how, how fast everything went, um, it really did seem that um, oh. everything everything just ended so so quickly. I mean, we had all these recent findings about police corruption involved with best investigations, and the defence actually moved to postpone the trial um, so that they could postpone it until after the um, police corruption investigations had all finished, so that they could use that evidence. Because currently, you know, they weren't being allowed to use evidence that said that the main people involved with the police investigation um, were stealing money from the government, stealing money from Silk Road, doing money laundering, involved in fraud. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. But no one on the defence was, was allowed to use this information. Um, and rather than allowing uh, the trial to be pushed back until they could use this information. The prosecution actually moved to have, I think it was called the people's right to a speedy trial. I mean, it's just, that's just so that, crazy. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty amazing, I thought, yeah. Ross has a right to a speedy yeah. trial, so let's deprive him of his due process rights to a fair trial. Yeah. I think I'd rather yeah, have a fair no, trial. It's, um, it's, it was just, it's uh, and what I found out, which is even more amazing and, and upsetting, is that their excuse for, oh, it's going to jeopardize the investigation if it comes out at trial. Those agents were already knew they were under investigation the previous May. Mm -hmm. They've already been inter interviewed by the government. And, and this came, just came out in the defense's um, response. 
So that that is a bogus excuse. They already knew. It yeah. wasn't going to jeopardize anything. It, what it would do, yeah. what it did was it jeopardized Ross's is right to a fair trial. That's what it jeopardized. That's right. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about um, about Bridges, um, about Force? What was their involvement? What have they been found guilty of? How did that actually play out? Um, well, what I what I you know I know what you know you know I don't only know public information, but um, I know that Force was the lead undercover investigator at the core of the investigation in Baltimore, and um, that Bridges. Uh, he was former DEA. He's former DEA, and Bridges was Secret Service. And Bridges was a computer forensics expert. Is a computer forensic e expert. That was his job. So they they were both fairly sophisticated technologically, and um, they arrested Curtis Green, who was a high level administrator on the site, known as Flush, and basically um, he turned over his administrative. Um, access, which was very, opened up the whole thing, and they, they had all kinds of, um, of access, uh, let's see, um, to platforms. So they had the password, to, they, yeah, to changing yeah. passwords, changing pins, number, all of that. They, so, had DP, mm -hmm. they could change the pin number on DPR's account and gain yeah. control of it, and even yeah, without so, DPR losing access. They had the means to manipulate logs, chats, private messages, keys, accounts, posts. Yeah. So yeah. So was, what I mean, there there are two parts to this. So one of the one of the uh, the parts is what's been made public, um, what they've actually been been charged with. Um, mm -hmm. They, they all of this information was turned over by this person Green, who was working for the Silk Road. Uh, Green had been found in p possession of a large amount of cocaine, and so then started um, helping police. Um, and turned over information about how to use the Silk Road uh, administrative uh, platform. Uh, then these two corrupt officers actually used that information that day. Uh, it seems they took a sick leave uh, for the rest of the day. Um, I think it was, I mean, how much money went missing? It was, it was almost a million dollars, uh, depending on when you, when you, um, uh, trade in your, your your Bitcoin, but a tremendous amount of money until the rest of the admin on, on Silk Road were able to, to shut it down and, and change the password and, and get him off there. And this information, I mean, it was only just released recently that these police officers were um, involved in, in stealing money um, from the Silk Road site. But I mean, this has several implications. Um, and this actually ties into a question that David Nace has asked. Um, he says, what kind of cyber forensic evidence was pre presented that actually pointed at your son. And what we're dealing with now is just a very interesting situation where so much of our lives lives on the internet. Um, and in the past, you know, it, the amount of digital evidence that has been presented in case has always had to be minimal because digital evidence by its nature can be easily corrupted. It's easily malleable. So, I mean, we have two pro uh, police officers who have proven to be corrupt, who had access to the administrative platform, who could have changed a tremendous amount of details. Um, and we're taking all of this, uh, this evidence um, for, for granted that, it, that it's all, all reliable. Legitimate, yeah. Um, and they had the motive so, to to do that because you know if you're stealing all that money, you want to direct attention elsewhere. You want to have a breadcrumb trail that you create that the prosecution can follow towards somebody else. You know, I mean that would just make sense. So that and you know there's a whole lot more we still don't know. Um, the government doesn't say or hasn't confirmed the extent of what they did or how or the extent of their communications. They're still sealed as uh, parts of the complaint that they're not revealing. Um, so there's a whole lot more. We don't. We have no idea. Yeah, you know, we just. Yeah, and I, I believe the defense actually. Yeah, I believe the defense actually um, argued to have that opened up, to have more information about Force and Bridges uh, revealed. And this was denied. This uh, motion was denied because it was ruled that um, the defense could not prove that they, that whatever information was there was helpful for the defense. And it's such a catch-22 argument because how can you prove that something is going to be helpful for your case if you don't know what that information is? Right. Um, it, it's just very it's anxious still very strange. Things from the jury. They were very anxious. So that makes me wonder, what are you afraid of? You know, if it's not relevant mm -hmm. and it's not, you know, what's the big deal? 
you know, if you exactly. have such a, a strong case. Yeah, so. no, that's, that's, um, you know, I want to point out, right. so, there have been other courts who have struck down the use of digital evidence, um, and, and it was referenced many times in the trial, Vain, uh, U.S. versus Vayner uh, struck down the use of um, uh, screenshots, uh, certain screenshots. A mortgage company will not accept a screenshot of your bank statement because they know how easily faked it is. They won't take it. So yeah. uh, this, what's happened here is that the standard of evidence has been lowered dramatically um, right. by accepting so, this evidence. So what, yeah, so what kinds of cyber um, forensic evidence, as David asks, was presented that actually points to Ross? Uh, you know, I really don't feel qualified to go into the details of all that. Yeah. Honestly, it's a lot of stuff that I, I think we would just get. I mean, there's, um, right. and, and I actually don't have, um, I'm not privy to all of the information and discovery. So. Right. Yeah, well, but it seems that, I mean, the trial the, are available. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know. yeah. It seems that the um, that there was a Forbes article that I referenced earlier that basically says, you know, it's an interview with Dread Pirate Roberts, and it says, um, yes, I inherited this site from a previous owner. I was not the one who set it up. Um, and uh, it, it goes on to elucidate how there have actually been um, multiple Dread Pirate Roberts, and this is this was in the public sphere. I mean, this was an article published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, all of that Forbes evidence interview. was actually not admit admissible. Yeah, right, right. That was the Forbes interview with Andy Greenberg um, with DPR That's in right. August of 13, which doesn't sound like Ross at all. Anyone who knows Ross and goes, "That's not Ross talking," it just not at all. But you know, this, just to digress into this multiple DPR thing, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, Alex Winter did um, directed a very good documentary, Deep Web, that um, he really goes deeply into it and um, mm -hmm. interviewed people very far inside Silk Road, and they all told him, and he told me this, yeah, there were more than one DPR. There's at least two or three. One of them said, you know, I wanted to set up a second vendor account, and DPR said no. I said, you know, just go talk to the other DPR, would you? Because I, I know him. He'll let me do it. And he did. I mean, they yeah. knew there was more than one DPR. And besides which, they said, you could tell. They were different ages, different attitudes, different personalities. Um, yeah. Amir Taki uh, told me himself that he had chatted with DPR, uh, and, you know, they had this long chat. And then about a year later, he chatted with him again. The guy didn't even remember the first conversation, but he said he was a totally different person. It's obvious that he was a different DPR. Um, I personally, um, I was, and I read all the DPR chats in the forum. I mean, not chats. Excuse me. Um, well, DPR entries in the D forum from DPR. Yeah. And um, one of them really got my attention. It was uh, November thirteenth uh, of twelve. And there was some crisis on the site, and DPR's like, oh, I'm going to be slamming back the caffeine tonight. Well, Ross never drinks caffeine, ever. In fact, when he was reviewing Discovery, I tried to get him to drink tea because he said he was groggy, and he said, I can't. I can't deal with caffeine. Yeah. That wasn't Ross. So yeah. there's all these questions, you know, and um, to say, yes, that's absolutely the person behind that handle, yeah. You know, really, to answer the question that, that was asked, you can't prove who's behind the computer screen. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, and, the, and the so fact that all of the, it's, yeah, it's the fact that all of the, um, all of the information that was submitted that pointed to other people being Judd Pirate Roberts was uh, deemed inadmissible. It's just, I mean, it's yeah. just a, a, a very confusing trial. Um, so a lot of people are asking what the basis for the appeal is going to be. Um, what is the, the defense's uh, perspective? What, what is their plan? I, you know, I, I don't know all the details of it. Um, I think that the fact that, um, I know that Josh called for a mistrial more than once during the trial, and um, mm -hmm. that he wasn't allowed to question witnesses where he should have been able to, he said, mm -hmm. and um, cross-examine and um, just proceed with the defense properly, I would guess would be part of it. Um, that's a violation of due process. Um, yeah. Probably the uh, a Fourth Amendment question of the seizure of the laptop, which again, that evidence, you can, the FBI went into a long explanation of how you can plant 
things on people's laptops very easily. Roth was on an open source network downloading the Colbert Report in the library when right before he was arrested. It's open. It's easy to do. It just opens that question. There's a lot of questions about the laptop. But anyway, they had what was called a general warrant for the laptop. The Fourth Amendment says you have to have a particular description of what you're searching for when you go into someone's house, say, and you're looking mm -hmm. for something. Apparently, the excuse is, well, a laptop doesn't count. Even if they'd gone into his house and gone through his file drawers and his desk drawers, it would be clearly unconstitutional. But because it's on his laptop, it's not. Even though we keep more of our lives on our computers and phones now than in our file drawers. And it's a very yeah, important that's question definitely to a into the digital age. It's an important constitutional question. And I imagine, I don't know for sure, that that may be one of the um, points brought up. Um, yeah, well, I mean, there are definitely some very scary precedents that are being set up from this case. So I would say that that is definitely one of them. Um, having a general warrant for something versus having a clearly defined warrant. And as more and more one of, of our lives live on the American Internet. Exactly. They thought the American exactly. Revolution. Exactly. So, so as more of our lives live on the Internet, uh, you can't just specify, well, all electronic files. That's the, the narrowing we do. I mean, all, and my whole life is, is in the form of electronic files. So it's just, it, it's a very scary thing going forward because we're basically handing over our rights um, by setting up this, this precedent, by saying, yes, you're now allowed to invade all aspects of my life. Um, I mean, other precedents that are being set up by this case, did you want to talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, well, there's the, there is the precedent of um, what the theory of transferred intent, which is saying a website host is responsible for crimes on his site. And, you know, oh, you know, people will say, well, it's Silk Road and it's drugs and that's different. But the federal government has indicted Federal Express under the same theory, saying that um, for drug trafficking and money laundering, because people use Federal Express to send illegal pharmaceuticals. They say FedEx is responsible for what their customers did with their service. So this is a very kind of frightening and expansive approach, and they relied on it very heavily in this case. And uh, Ross's lawyer says it, it puts a crack in the door for other website hosts to be responsible for what you know is on their site. And other yeah. people have said the same, have expressed the same concern. Yeah. So that's another. And the other scary precedent is the server. <laughs> There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of, um, yeah, the other and, scary and, precedent being set up, I mean, accepting more and more digi digital evidence as hard evidence. Right. Um, as you, as we mentioned before, a lot of that could be easily forged. And then, you know, the final precedent, how did um, they actually find the server? That is a huge question. The yeah. defense were not allowed to bring in anyone to ask uh, for questioning about this. The person who actually found the server wasn't allowed to be brought in to be cross-examined. Um, well, this was a server that in. ended yeah, up being in Iceland. Yeah. yeah, it was like so, it didn't I mean, exist. Right. So um, how, how did they find this? Were there dubious methods? Was it, um, you know, illegal methods used? And then they retroactively pieced together a story which experts then said was uh, just not, it was technically impossible to have happened. I mean, all of this just puts huge question marks over the validity of the, the evidence. Um, the idea that all evidence that, that came from dubious methods in the first place, I mean, it, it really should be stricken. Yeah, and, it, you know, the FBI Tarbell's explanation was debunked worldwide. I mean, experts were calling it a lie and gibberish, and he said this under oath. This is how I found the server. And then when asked to prove it, he said, oh, darn, I didn't save my work. I can't prove it. I'm like, you didn't save mm -hmm. your work on a major yeah. investigation? And, um, you know, it's very dubious. And... When yeah. the defense asked for an evidentiary hearing, um, it was, well, it was a whole catch-22 involved, but it didn't happen. And um, it seems the question like is, can the United States uh, hack into, possibly hack into, and we're not, they haven't, it's not been proven they did it, but maybe they did it, um, a server in a foreign country without a warrant? And um, yeah. they say, well, yeah, we can. We can do that. Basically, they say that. So, <laughs> It's, it's a question. It's definitely a, a question it's, it's for the a digital age. It's a little bit crazy. 
I mean, yeah. what we have now is uh, you have uh, so many government agencies who are using technology for all of the wrong reasons. So they're using it as an excuse. If uh, they do something wrong, they don't want people to find out about it. Oh, you know, the FBI's uh, hard drive broke. So did the backup. So did the backup of the backup. So did the backup of the backup of the back. Like they all just magically, you know, stopped working. You know, Hillary's server. I, I see William, you're, you're uh, asking this question here. I mean, so many of these people are using this as an excuse to say, oh, well, no technology failed, so I can't be held accountable. Now, why does it work that way for people who are in a position of power, but for you know everyone else, it's the technology that that uh, actually puts them, you know, convicts people and is used as as hard evidence. You know, um, uh, evidence that that is digital, evidence to do with, with technology that if it was the other way around would be inadmissible because you can't really prove it. You can't right. really have any hard evidence. Um, I mean, it's just it just seems like it's it's being used to oppress people at this stage, you know, um, it, it's it's really scary. And I think that this is a, a really important case that we don't set up these precedents for, for future cases so that we actually retain our rights when it comes to technology. Otherwise, this is this is a very abusive um, precedent that we're setting up. This could lead to a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Well, the government said in their papers um, that their laws are expansive even when, especially when it comes to the internet. They put that in writing. They, and so they're saying, you know, we are going to expand our power and jurisdiction, especially when it comes to the internet. And uh, yes, it is, it is very alarming. You know, you just have to read 1984. <laughs> like, the potential is there. Yeah. yeah. Very scary. Um, so you, you have uh, Aslan Freeman who says that it's your fave lion here. Um, ah. so I'm not quite sure what that, what that means. So but, uh, uh, this person says that right? uh, they say that they're, they're watching uh, from the UK even though it is almost 1.30 in the morning over oh, there. Oh, they're so, so great. So you guys are so this supportive. Is, yeah. Thank you. This case is very important to a lot of people uh, the world over. I mean, you think about the fact that the server is in Iceland. What sort of jurisdiction does the US have to go into a server in Iceland? Um, I mean, it just seems that this is a case that is going to be affecting the entire world. Yeah, well, press, what happens is, and, and Drake, Josh Drachel explained this to me. He said, you know, you have a major case, it sets precedent, and then it quickly just trickles down very easily, very rapidly to ordinary cases. And then over time, our, our protections are eroded, government slowly expands or quickly expands, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. this is the way it is. That's what happens with precedent. And he said that yeah. it, it is very traditional for the government to use high-profile cases to make bad law, and then we all get to live with it. So yeah. it's not just one case. It's a major case that impacts lots of cases, and that, of course, impacts law, and then it affects all of us. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of conflicts of interest involved with this case as, as well, especially when it comes down to bridges and force. Um, I, yeah. uh, there have been a lot of reports about their duplicity in this, in that they were actually enlisted by the government to go undercover, work on the site, gain uh, DPR's trust. And what ended up happening was then they set up multiple um, pseudonyms on the account, user usernames on the account, um, and used you know, quite a lot of uh, them to interact with DPR, but actually didn't log them. So the government had no idea what sort of interaction they actually had with DPR. Um, and so far, we have a set number. DPR. Yeah. I mean, yeah. be honest, they don't yeah, I know. know that they didn't operate as DPR some of the time or whenever. Yeah. whenever. Yeah, and, I mean, it seems like an outlandish thing to say, but it's completely accurate. And uh, you only have a few of the... They yeah. had access to DPR's yeah, we, account. Yeah, we only have a few usernames that um, that are actually proven to be these uh, law enforcement agents. And uh, there are still uh, so many others in question that they haven't yet proved, but they're in suspicion of owning as well. I mean, how many other um, usernames are out there that, that we haven't even looked at yet? Um, right. What were these people doing? I mean, it just casts so much doubt on this entire investigation. Well, they didn't even, they didn't know one of them until the defense told them at trial. That was death from above. They didn't even know about right. that being force um, alias. Um, so the government doesn't know all of them either. You know, yeah, yeah, there's a lot that has not been revealed. 
It is very scary. I mean, there was also, so Bridges was actually working uh, on the Mt. Gox uh, seizure as well. So he was investigating uh, car pellets and there's a lot of overlap there between the two cases with car pellets coming forward with the name of who he thought was DPR uh, and that being different to who the government ended up prosecuting. Well, that was um, but, you know, that was there, Baltimore that they, that car pellets yeah. lawyers approach was Baltimore. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, you had what, what happened with, with Bridges was he, um, Basically, he knew about the seizure of the money on, on Mount Gox. He had put a tremendous amount of, of money in there, which was stolen from uh, Silk Road. And before the seizure, because he knew the seizure was coming, he withdrew all of his cash. Um, I think it was just a, a matter of a few days or even a day before the seizure. So there are all these accounts of conflict of interest, which he's now been charged with. Um, do you think, like, what are the chances of the court coming back um, to your appeal for a, another trial and saying yes, this uh, this does cast a lot of doubt on the on the uh, case. What do you think the chances of that happening are? Well, I think in, normally it's very hard to win on appeal, um, but you know I don't know. I I hope I'm very hopeful. Our um, yeah. lawyers said we have very strong <laughs> strong issues for appeal, so it depends on those three appellate judges. Yeah, and, um, and it seems that um, the the media has had so much play in um, demonizing Ross through through the press, and it's really sad. It, it, it's it's just it's such a, a tragedy that this has happened, and um, and and what you see is is them casting all of these uh, these accusations about the murder for hire, all of this. I mean, he was never actually indicted for murder for hire. Is that correct? He this was not wasn't actually years, brought up. There were originally six charges. Five of them were basically yeah. dropped, although they got to talk about it at the trial, even though he was not charged right. with it, mm -hmm. which is extremely prejudicial mm -hmm. to a jury. It seems to me that yeah. if you're going to be accusing someone of something that um, serious, you should have to prove it, you should have to charge them, or not get to talk about it at trial. But they did. Yeah. Uh, there's an indictment left in, of all places, Maryland. So. You know, and Karl Marx, of course, was extremely involved in that murder for hire scenario. So, yeah. you know, I've always known that this was not true, that Ross was involved, because I know Ross. And, you know, you read these things yeah. in the media, and, of course, these people have no clue who Ross is. They're quoting each other. They're, they're motivated. They, meaning, you know, a lot of people, journalists are motivated by having people read their story and sensationalism sells. And, um, you know, and uh, frankly, um, a lot of them are quite sloppy about what they say. Um, I had one, read one that said, oh, he was convicted for murder. I'm like, well, it's hard to be convicted when you're not even charged. You know, they just say this stuff. Now, not all of them, but um, to be honest, after all of this, I've come to where I'm extremely skeptical about what I read in the media and basically don't believe anything the government says. So I've gotten to where, I think that's well, I read that, but uh, it might be true, might not be. I have yeah. no idea, you know, unless you really yeah, do your no, research. It's, uh, I, I've always been pretty skeptical of the media, but it really is quite <laughs> scary when reporters yeah. are just reporting other reporters who are misreporting things or, you know, it's, it, it's a bit crazy. Um, so uh, Jimmy is asking, yeah, yeah. Everybody's Jimmy is asking uh, if you talk to Ross every day. No, I don't talk to him every day. He has limited uh, minutes. First of all, he's restricted from using email. Most prisoners can because of the charge of conspiracy to hack into a computer. They, they never, I don't actually think Ross has the ability to hack into a computer, but anyway, um, he's not particularly proficient at, um, you know, programming. But um, in any case, that, the, the charge basically is there was software that could be used to hack into computers, sold on Silk Road. There's no one that says their computer was hacked. There was no one, there's no proof that hacking occurred. But they're saying he conspired to hack because someone on Silk Road sold this software. So because of that, that's one of the charges, and um, he can't have email. So I don't get to communicate with him that way. He does call, but he has a limited number of minutes a month, and you know he calls different people. 
but I see him. I go and visit him, and so does his dad and other people when they can, uh, when they're in town, or family members. I'm going to see him tomorrow. And um, yeah. so I get to see him. And then, you know, he writes letters too, snail mail. And if people want to write him, you know, encouragement or just a friendly letter, it'd be really nice. He feels very cut off. He feels, you know, it's hard. It's tough. It's very hard to be in there. Um, you know, sometimes I'll eat a nice meal and I think Ross has not had a decent meal. He hasn't had fresh vegetables in over a year. He's, the food there is pretty bad. <laughs> it's horrendous. And um, yeah. or I'll go for a walk outside, and I think, oh, you know, Ross hasn't been outside barely. You know, yeah. he gets to go up on a rooftop in that long. Uh, Lynn, yeah, is there a way that people can um, can contact Ross if they wanted to, if they wanted to write him a supportive letter or something like that? Yeah, um, on our website, freeross.org, there's a contact us tab, and his address is right at the top. Be sure and put his number. Recently, um, actually, Tatiana Moroz, who's great supporter and wonderful, wrote a song about um, Ross, um, wrote him a letter and she forgot to put the number and it came back. I said, hey, he's not, he's a number now. You got to put that number or you, he won't get it. So, but yep, yes, you can That's write so him so well. and, and it'd be really nice um, to do that. Um, I'm sh you know, he likes to get letters. Yeah, I've added the uh, contact there, um, the, the link in the chat box if anyone wants oh, to thanks. do that. Um, so JJ is asking, what is the actual charge that he was convicted with, and what is the charge he still faces in Maryland? Okay, I've got it up here. Um, there's seven charges. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is distributing or aiding and abetting the distribution of narcotics. So even if he didn't actually do it, they're saying he aided and abetted others doing it because he had a website. So that means he is guilty of that count. The second count is um, doing the same thing, but on the internet. So basically, this is piling on. It's the same action, but they do it and they charge it in different ways so they can get more counts. And his attorney said this is not unusual, and it sounds way worse. But each one carries its own mandatory minimum, so it's serious. So count one is distributing or aiding and betting the distribution of narcotics. Count two is um, doing it on the internet, basically. Count three is conspiring with people to violate narcotics laws. You know, basically another way of saying the same thing. Count four is engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise, which is the kingpin charge, which completely counteracts aiding and abetting. You can't be just a helper and the guy who runs the show. But he's convicted of both, because he can magically do both. And then um, the kingpin charge requires that the kingpin is organizing and managing five specific people. The government has never named these people, and yet he still is being, he's been convicted of this without proof that he actually did what the statute requires. Um, and um, then count five, long list. Count five is um, conspiring, the computer hacking, which I talked about before, and that no hacking was actually proven. No one came forward to say, my computer was hacked. In fact, no victim at all has come forward to say Ross has hurt them in any way. You know, there's a lot of, um, I'm reading the Federal Prison Guidebook, and uh, they talk a lot about making restitution to victims and, and victims, and there, no one's come forward and say, I'm a victim of Ross. Um, and then um, count six is conspiring with others, again, not actually doing it, but conspiring to traffic in fraudulent IDs, because I guess people sold them on Silk Road. And then count seven is conspiring to commit money laundering. So it's a lot about conspiracy. There's a lot of conspiracy um, language in it. Mm -hmm. so. All right. And then um, in Maryland, is that uh, are they still pressing the murder for hire charge? There is a remaining murder for hire charge. The thing about Mar an indictment is an indictment has a very low bar of proof. An indictment doesn't mean you you've been proven to have done anything. It's basically can be based on hearsay. It's just being accused. Yeah. That thing's been sitting there now since October 13, so let, I believe so, but certainly well over a year, almost a year and a half. Uh, I'm not, you know, Ross's lawyer said, well, that indicates that um, basically it has no merit. They didn't put it into the 
New York case. And, um, but it's, it's still sitting there, despite the corruption in Maryland. I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there was so much. Both of the officers, for those who um, didn't realize this, both of the officers were, were from Maryland. Um, yeah. The corruption came from there. So they were actually not involved at all. Yeah, they, they were not actually involved in all at all in the New York case. I don't know, well, perhaps the, the prosecution thought. Okay. That's completely true. Um, and that's what the prosecution is saying. Well, it's totally separate. It's totally separate. But the recent reply yeah. by the um, defense uh, goes into detail about how the Chicago, Maryland, and New York cases all work together, and that it was exactly. intertwined. Yeah. And I mean, it's a different, it's not the same, they're not involved in the trial, that's true, but they even submitted exhibits uh, pre-trial to about Karl Marx Force and his aliases, several of them. So they were relying on evidence from Karl Marx Force, apparently, and then they redacted it. Mm -hmm. So they, yeah. it was definitely intertwined, um, according to Ross's lawyer, and um, so it's not so separate, but they, it wasn't, yeah, the, the prosecutors were New York prosecutors, that's true. I mean, it just se seems very fishy when, uh, you know, a, a charge sits there for so long, isn't acted upon, uh, he's not indicted for this, and you find out that the two agents who are most involved with this uh, were incredibly corrupt and stole a whole bunch of money, you know, and uh, were, were right in the thick of whatever this, this charge involved. Like, it's just, I mean, it, it's it's so crazy. Um, so JJ is also asking, what kind of presents can we send him? Um, can well, we send food say, packages? Can we send books? I just want to sum up that other thing by saying, okay, so out of the six accusations of murder for hire, five of them were not charged, and one of them involves uh, corrupt agents who were at the uh, center of that whole murder for hire um, scenario. Yeah. And so to me, the murder for hire thing is so suspect that, and that's been what's been talked about more than anything. And that's what, yeah. you know, anyway, uh, and I, I am confident that if the truth were out, and I hope it will be, that Ross will be completely exonerated. Um, yeah. You know, unfortunately, you can't send, the only thing you can send are books and magazines directly from a bookseller like Amazon. You can't, I want to send him food so badly. <laughs> I want to send him a direct package from, you know, a food company and, uh, or Amazon. So, you know, but uh, apparently that is not permitted. Um, the thing is, right now, he does. we don't know where he'll be after sentencing, which is coming right up, so probably it'd be best to wait. Um, but books are always great, and magazine subscriptions, or even printing out articles that you think would be interesting. Um, but um, in fact, we're very concerned because depending on the sentencing, if it's enough years, that determines what kind of facility, like maximum security, for instance, versus medium security, you're put oh. in. And yeah, we're very, we're concerned about his safety, frankly. Um, yeah. He's not, he's not a criminal kind of guy. He's not a, a, a tough, I mean, you know, he's just a regular guy, you know, that you would be happy to have dinner with or as a neighbor or a friend or go hiking with or whatever. He's not really prepared by his background or who he is to be put in that kind of environment and um, yeah. very um, troubling, concerned about it. I mean, I would say to everyone the most important thing that you could do right now, rather than sending Ross books and magazines and all of that, I mean, Lynn, I, you are, are paying for this entire trial out of pocket. Um, I know that this is putting you in, into debt, you know, paying all of this off. If people donate money for this so that you can actually, um, uh, you know, uh, put, a, put a motion forward to have another trial, um, the retrial would be so important to this case. That would eliminate all of these unnerving uh, precedents that we talked about before. Uh, this is such an important time. This is when people need to mobilize and give the defense the best resources that you, you can possibly have. So I'm going to post another link in the chat for everyone so that you can see where you can donate money um, from. Of course, you can give in, in Bitcoin. You can also use uh, PayPal. Um, there are a bunch of different options there. So I'm going to post that right there. Um, yes, Aton, they, of course they take Bitcoin. What, what is this? Um, but yeah, no, th this is such an important time. Uh, mobilize, tell everyone how important this case is. As we talked about a whole bunch, it just, Russ was not given a, free, a fair trial. 
um, if he can get another trial that actually looks at all of the corruption involved with the investigation, that actually looks at all of the evidence that the prosecution wouldn't let them put forward for really no no reason at all, really just to handicap the, the case. Um, if we can allow a better trial to go forward, then you know Ross might actually have a chance. And the only way we can ensure that he has a chance is by donating money to the defence's case and making sure that they actually have resources to, to support themselves. So. Um, so if yeah, if people do that, spread the um, the, the QR code around, uh, spread the Bitcoin address. I'll, I'll post the uh, the direct Bitcoin address actually um, for all of you who want that. There we go. Yeah, I want to say thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's true. We have trial is really expensive, and our lawyers, yeah. you know, we owe them so much money, but. Um, uh, I, I can't even think about it because it's um, you know too overwhelming. But yeah, um, yeah it, it's expensive and it's terrible that it is. <laughs> to but it it is and especially with a case like this, it's so complex. You really need good lawyers, and I believe we have really good lawyers, and they're working really hard and they're being really patient. I mean, uh, you know, with us in terms of payment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's not just for us, as Naomi is saying. You know, it, it's about this precedent, it's about the fact that it, mm -hmm. a citizen didn't get a free, a fair trial here, and he's not the only one. I mean, 97%, I believe I've read, and I could be off a little, but I think 97% of people accused of a crime are advised to plea, and they do, because they're afraid to go to trial. They're afraid of facing more draconian punishment if they lose, and the odds of them losing are great. This isn't right. We have a right to a fair trial yeah. here in this country. And yeah, so exactly. a lot of times I've read that people plead to things they didn't even do out of fear of, you know, they, they're hedging their bets. This is wrong. And our, 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 yeah. our prisons are just bursting with nonviolent mm -hmm. offenders because of the drug war that, um, oh, gosh. you know, it, it's, it's awful. And I meet these people. Yeah. I, I, I go to the prison. You know, I'm going tomorrow. And we all wait together and we talk and we see the children and, and the families that are just shattered and torn apart. And these are nonviolent offenders. I, I, I don't, I just, it just seems very, very wrong. And um, our system yeah. is, is, there's something very wrong here. And so well, as I feel like in says, a way, I'm fighting for him. But also, this needs to be fought. This is a battle that needs to be fought. And, you know, I know a lot of people don't have tons of money. I mean, if you do, please give us a bunch. <laughs> but, you know, even just the price of a cup of coffee, if enough people do it, you know, it, it adds up and it helps. It just keeps the cash flow a little bit going, um, yeah. you know, a little bit even. It, it really Yeah, it really as, as William says, you know, usually the government will offer you a plea bargain and if you don't accept it, then they bury you in charges and they bankrupt you. And yeah, well, um, they really don't want us to have on, Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. They exactly. don't want, want Ross to have a chance in this. Um, Aton just announced that he has just uh, donated. So thank you so much. That is absolutely wonderful. Anyone who can do that, it is it is so appreciated, um, not just for, by the Ulbricht family, but anyone who understands the case, anyone who understands how important this trial is uh, for setting future pre precedents. Um, you know, all, all of us, thank you uh, for that. It's, it's just really wonderful. Um, yeah. So we have a final question here from Derek. Uh, he asks, Lynn, would you ever consider running for president? <laughs> no. no uh, I, I would I would, I would um, vote for you. Um, <laughs> um, I think you've got the right idea. Uh, I do want to say real quick, we haven't paid for the whole thing ourselves. We've rate, we have paid a lot <laughs> and it has definitely negatively impacted our, uh, our uh, finances, to, you know, badly. However, we've had a lot of support from people and I just want to say that I want to say how grateful we've been of course Roger Veer was tremendously helpful I mean my gosh he, he makes a huge difference um, but he but Roger wasn't the only one and of course and, and and not everybody can afford to do what Roger did but I just wanted to say that because we couldn't have done this without already having people stand beside us and help us with this so it's really it's really yeah. been very moving. I mean, that's been one of the silver linings, you might say, or, or things as the people I've met and even online and just the support. It's been, it's very heartening 
you know, to know we're not alone and that, um, you know, we're all, you know, there's a lot of people who care about freedom and about these issues. Mm -hmm. And that's very heartening. Yeah. Yeah. We just had um, Derek just announced that he just donated a hundred dollars. So thank you ah, so much, Derek. That you. is wonderful. Yeah, um, and Lynn, well, thank you so much for happy. coming here. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming on tonight, Lynn, and oh, for chatting yeah, to us about you. the case and for spreading the word about how important this is. I mean, not just for you personally, as I said, for everyone. This is an important issue. And the more we can get this out there, um, the more chance people have to take action, you know, to fight this while we still can. So thank you yeah, so thank much you. for coming here. Thank you to any everyone who came to um, to view this today. I thank you for your interest in this topic. Um, and to all the people who donated as well. And Lynn, That's we all great. wish you all of the best. Thanks. We're all fighting beside you. You have so much support out there uh, from people and, and I hope that we can get those people mobilized so that, that you can mm -hmm. feel some of that support. Some more. And I'll tell Ross Thank tomorrow. Thank you and good luck. I'll, and... I'll tell Ross tomorrow. Yeah. He'll, it'll really encourage him. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please do. Is there any last word you wanted to say before we sign off? No, just that I'll, I'll tell Ross about what a great, you know, hour we've had and, and all the support and, you know, just how much we really um, feel uplifted yeah. by it. And he, he will yeah, be too. Please, please send him all of our love and uh, let him know that we're, we're all gunning for him, you know. Right, thank you. We're all, we're all there. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. We will sign off now and, um, yeah, chat to you next episode. Okay.